Hello and welcome to The Current Thing with me, Nick Dixon, where we talk about politics, the culture war, and anything else that comes up. And today we have a very special guest, a kind of crossover episode, in a sense, journalist, co-host of the London Calling podcast with our mutual friend, Mr. Toby Young, and of course, host of the very successful Dellingpod podcast. It is Mr. James Dellingpod. Thanks for doing the show, James. Hello, Nick. Um, I'm going to apologise to your, your view, viewers and listeners on your behalf that you've um, had a stomach bug for five days and you haven't eaten and you're you're well below par. Although I have to say, to me, to my kind of late middle-aged eyes, you're looking in the pink of health and the, the <laughs> first flush of youth. And I also want to point out, while we're talking about illnesses and stuff, I've been experimenting with this very tedious, I have to say, keto diet. And one of the things that it does is it gives you the squits. Um, so if I have to dash off, so, so look, what I'm saying is we're kind of both in the same boat, actually, yeah. in different ways. Yeah. Well, thanks for flagging that, James. Yeah, I did mention it before the show. Yeah, I'm looking slightly better today. It's largely lighting. But yeah, I was puking all the other night, up all night. Then I have barely, barely eaten anything, didn't eat for 60 hours. Then I've eaten toast. It's very good, grim. And I have to flag it because podcast listeners will just write some review where they say, oh, Nick wasn't on his usual game. It was a wasted opportunity with James, you know, something like that. And I'll just have to do you be think, incredibly... Do you think we may have um, so grossed out our, our audience that, <laughs> that, that, that they won't get that far? I mean, Yeah, I might have to cut that bit. Yeah, already we'll edit that bit. Just take all that out. But yeah, yeah I, think, I think people like it. They like no, the No, keep it real. Keep, keep it, it real, That's man. my motto, Nick. Keep, keep, <laughs> keep it always. No edits. I mean, except for maybe libel reasons. You wouldn't, go, you wouldn't want to get get cancelled because some rich tosser um, found, a, found a, 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 loop, a loophole where he could take you to the cleaners. You wouldn't want that. Yeah, well, my first episode was Andrew Bridgen. I thought, I'll put it straight on Twitter. That would be a good idea. Matthew Sweet finds it. Long thread about why I'm evil. And then tries to claim we've said something libelous or that Andrew has. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll take that bit out then. So that happens to be on the first episode. There were always haters, James. They do long... I, don't, I didn't even read the thread, but people messaged me and said... You might have a slight legal issue here. They write whole threads about me. Matthew Sweet called yeah, you Yeah, do you not know who that is? He didn't uh, call me evil, but it, I'm, I'm summarising. It, it was like a long being thread called a Nazi about... by Hitler. <laughs> yeah, he might not have used the word evil, but it was a long thread about how I'm bad and why. And everyone on GB gets I hope you are Basically, bad. Well, I'd be disappointed yeah, if that. you weren't, in the eyes of yeah. Matthew Sweet anyway. That is true. We're all on the on the. If, yes, if you're evil to Matthew Sweet, you're probably good. It's a good rule of thumb. And Otto English, may as well name the other one while we're here. They're the two big ones, aren't oh. they? Yeah, but you know what? Here's my policy, Nick. I, I've seen them lurking on Twitter, and if you engage them, you kind of reify them. They they desperately want to be personalities. They're def- they, they they so badly want to be important. And who are they? I mean, where do they come from? What are they? What are they doing? The, it's if you if you give them a t- it's, it's it's like a toddler when it's having a tantrum. If you give it attention, it'll carry on doing it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I try not to. I said one thing about Mr. Matthew Sweet, and he he laid into me for a, a series of threads. So yeah, don't don't exactly don't even engage. And I think he mainly does Doctor Who fan forums and things. He goes to like Doctor Who conventions, but we. We don't want to get into it because then he'll, he'll quote this whole podcast and write a long thread. But, you know, why we're both evil and wrong. Do you think um, he dresses as a sea devil or a cyberman or a <laughs> oh, Dalek? you're a Dalek. What's the half Dalek guy? Davros, is it? Davros. Yeah, probably. That's probably his thing. That's um, predictive programming, isn't it? That they, 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 they knew in the 1980s or was it the 70s? 80s, early 80s, that, that the most evil man in the world was going to come from Davros. And they just, ah, just see, put yeah. an R in. <laughs> I wasn't sure where you were going there. Davros, okay. Klaus yeah. Schwab is, the, is, is Davros. Um, all right. Didn't expect to get into Matthew Sweet so soon, but there it is. We always have to give him a quick name check. Um, what, what I really want to ask you, though, James, is um, you've sort of, you're well known, let's say, for being an esteemed, fairly mainstream journalist and then sort of going down a different route of the red pill world. And I think we all, anyone who listens to London Calling will know that, or the Delling Pod, but... My question is, what was the exact moment that happened for you? Because I'm assuming it was the whole COVID era. But was there an exact moment where you sort of thought, hang on, things are not quite as I thought before? Yeah, it's, it, it's a good question. And I wish my answer were cooler. Um, by which I mean, it was actually the 
trump um, the stolen election. I, I and really I should have been I should have been onto it much earlier because I read I read a whole book. I, I spent what five years maybe writing and researching my watermelons book about the green agenda, in which I I discovered somewhat to my surprise that the entire climate change environmental movement is basically the invention of a very narrow elite that I now call the predator class or the cabal. You know, they cooked up this stuff. They realised that climate change would be an excuse to, to bring forth a new world order. So I essentially wrote, wrote the book explaining this, but I didn't put two and two together and realised that what applied to climate change applied to every other issue too. But so... That was my kind of semi-red pull moment. But the thing that sent me down the rabbit hole was the stolen presidential election. And I'll tell you what I found weird about it. Okay, so it you could see the election being stolen in real time. We're talking about Trump, yeah. Um, and you could see how Trump was winning in the polls and 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 or winning actually uh, genuinely in terms of the, of, of the count. And then in the middle of the night, something happened. Something weird happened. You know, suddenly Biden was winning everywhere. And there were lots lots of other tells. It it was so blatantly obvious to me that this was an affront to, not just to democracy, as I understood it, but also to one's entire concept of all the the wonderful checks and balances in in the the US system. That that, that this, I, 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 I was genuinely naive to imagine otherwise. But at the time, I thought, well, you know, this is America. This is the leader of the free world. It, 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 who, who is president matters. It really does. And if an election can be stolen like this so flagrantly, what does it say about everything? So the real rabbit hole moment for me was when I realised that all my colleagues and contemporaries in the media, all the kind of the, the, the so-called right-wing columnists and commentators that I looked up to that or that I, I considered at least my equals and possibly my betters they were all going yeah Biden won nothing to see here the, 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 no not at all it wasn't stolen it was it was completely legitimate and um yeah and why did Biden win what was it that made Biden more popular than Trump well of course Trump did this and Trump did that and Trump said this and Trump Trump was really unpopular and I think they're just lying. They're just making shit up because we know that. I mean, I, I'm, by the way, I speak as somebody who's very skeptical about Trump now. I'm not. I'm, I'm not a Trumpista anymore, but I was at the time. Um, but we know that Trump was massively popular. We saw. We saw in the run up to the election that he was. He went on the campaign trail and he was getting these whooping crowds, filling arenas and stuff. Where was Biden? Biden was being kept from the electorate deliberately by his minders, because this is a guy who poops his pants, literally, who, who, who is senile, is, is, is handsy with, 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 with children and, 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 and young women and stuff. He was electorally toxic. He's got a son-in-law with a, with, with, oh, sorry, son with a, with a, a laptop full of porn and, and, and worse. Um, and, and yet we're told, yeah, in, in sober editorials across the, across the mainstream media, um, Everywhere, we were told we, we had sort of analyses of, of why it was that Biden won and why Trump lost. And I was thinking, this is just bullshit. This is the, they're gaslighting us. They how can this be? And they they do say that that when you go down the rabbit hole, in order to go there, no one can no one can persuade you. No one can show you the facts. No one can you know. If I wanted to red pill Tobes um, and presented him with this immaculate dossier on 9-11 or the moon landings and stuff he wouldn't leaf through this dossier and go wow james was right no the, 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 you, you can't fact bomb people into awareness they have to they have to go through some kind of trauma and it, it's the trauma that leads them to realize that the world as they've been as it has been sold to them is a lie and they have to question everything that they'd previously accepted as, as, as reality. And the trauma needs to be, I think, gen generally related to 
realizing that authorities, that the authorities that you'd, you'd previously respected cannot be trusted, that all your, all your elders, betters, superiors, uh, all the grown-ups in the room were lying to you. They didn't just lie to you in the old days about Father Christmas. They lied to you about everything. And that is the beginning of the heroic journey. And that's, and that's where you end up where I am now. Hmm. Very interesting answer. Trauma. Yeah, I'm trying to think where my trauma is. It might just be my whole life. But because um, I've sort of been on a steady diet of red pills for a long time where that's where I slightly differ from you. I didn't have like one massive moment. I just feel like I was like, yeah, of course, for a long time. So maybe my generation is more skeptical or, or maybe it's just me. But it's so much interesting stuff there about well, Toby, first of all, not to diss Toby, of course, on this podcast, but um, he, he doesn't even think JFK is dodgy. So <laughs> I, mean, that's really, I didn't think anyone still thought that. I was like, come on, Toby. I sort of mentioned 9-11. I said a few things. But he still thinks JFK is just totally legitimate. Yeah, I was like, you think it's Oswald? That's, and he's like, yeah. I'm like, Although, okay. in, in defense of Tobes, because uh, I'm, I'm always torn between these positions. Sometimes I think there is no way that Toby cannot be controlled opposition. And there are other times, where, and I have to remind people who make this accusation against Toby. I say, I remember not so long ago when I had my column on The Spectator that I wrote a piece once about conspiracies. And I remember I, I had to go to this... I had to go... David Aronovich, can you imagine this? David Aronovich wrote a book about conspiracy theories in which he purported to debunk all the conspiracy theories. And, and he had a, a Q&A session in the, the Frontline Club um, in W2. And I, um, I was bizarrely invited to be the compare or the, 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 the friendly questioner. So I had a perfectly friendly evening with David Aronovich and I, I sort of more or less accepted his premise that things like 9-11, JFK were... Um, were conspiracy theories and not real. And it wasn't so much that... Um, it wasn't that I'd looked into them. And it wasn't that I even had made an active decision not to look into them. It was more that I just accepted that they were one of those things that just wasn't worth my attention. A bit like football. I, again, it just, just like life's too busy. You know, I'm, 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 trying, to, I'm trying to deal with the real stuff. I'm I'm trying to deal with 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 politics and and whatever my interests are and and here's this stuff, which I've mentally, subconsciously indeed compartmentalises stuff that I needn't bother with because it's just too weird, and maybe that's still where 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 his mindset set is. I think that although I think we do live under virtually totalitarian levels of censorship in this country, although we're, we're constantly persuaded we're not, I think that the most aggressive censorship takes place in our own brains. We've already been programmed not to think things, not to say things, not to do things. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. And just for the record, I do think Toby is 100% sincere. I just disagree with him on, on things, that's all. I certainly don't believe he's any kind of... Uh you know, controlled opposition or anything like that. I think these are just his opinions. My only thing was I just couldn't believe that anyone still didn't even question the most sort of root one conspiracy, which would be JFK, is the most sort of basic example. But yeah, that's interesting. You're saying we just we just automatically dismiss them without even thinking about it. Um, they would say, of course, on the election, I largely agree with you. I mean, Tucker Carlson laughed at the idea the other night in his interview with Andrew Tate. He said the idea that Biden got more votes than Obama and he just laughed out loud. It was kind of absurd. They would argue there isn't any evidence for what you're saying. I would. There's also a moderate argument you can do in between, which is that with mail-in ballots and with things like ballot harvesting and with accepting all that what would normally be counted as spoiled ballots, which they suddenly accepted, which made it, which Victor Davis Hanson pointed out, made a big difference that they could have sort of done a version of it that's not literally rigging it, but is kind of using semi-legitimate or legitimate election methods. But I don't know, they would probably say to you, where's your evidence, James, for that um Why that would I claim? care what they say? <laughs> I'm just trying to put some sort of devil's advocate on. I don't, I yeah, I think it's stupid. I think it's, a, I think it's a waste of time. Fair enough. All right. Well, maybe it's more interesting to ask this, where, where I slightly disagree with you or, or, or maybe differ from you, because I've been described as seven-eighths 
Team James by one of your fans. So I'm nearly there. But I have a slight difference where my critique, and I know Toby's used this against you because he nicked it from me, but my critique is that is there a danger of having a healthy skepticism towards the mainstream narrative, but then once you become red-pilled, failing to apply the same skepticism to your sort of newfound worldview and, and therefore accepting any conspiracy or any, you know, red pill narrative. Is that, is that a danger? Well, um, first of all, I, I, I treat each conspiracy theory on, on its merits. Um, I think the, the, what, you're, what you're asking me is the, is the classic purple-pilled question. And I call purple pill people, people who have gone down the rabbit hole and and they're 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 comfortable with the with the kind of the regular mainstream conspiracies i mean if there is such a thing you know they know that 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 jfk wasn't shot by a lone gunman and they know that we didn't go to the moon and they feel comfortable about this but they feel uncomfortable with the idea that they've been that in holding these these views they've been they've cast themselves adrift from the mainstream and that they realise that they're, they they find themselves in awkward company, and so in order to maintain a foot in the the, the normie camp, they they show themselves that um, and I see this, you see this with with conservatives by the way, which I'll describe in a minute. Um, that the, they 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 find these conspiracies that they de, that they declare ex cathedra are outlandish. And they're not going to go there. And, and to hold these views is ridiculous and it discredits the cause. And they show themselves that, look, I may believe in some conspiracy theories, but there are areas where I won't go because that's where the crazies are. And, and really, I, I distance myself from them. You, I often, when, In the days when I used to appear on Any Questions and Question Time, um, which I, I, I'm very glad I don't do anymore, I noticed this, that when I would be on a, on a panel with the, the Conservative MP... The, the token conservative MP, the conservative a- MP would be would take great care to disagree with me on certain issues in order to demonstrate that they may be right wing but they're not rabid and, and so my job was to was was to be the the crazy right winger to be thrown to the wolves. Squishy conservatives are doing this all the time. Squishy red pe- uh, pink pill uh, purple pill people are doing this all the all, all the time. So. To go back to the point about um, taking each conspiracy on its merits, I before I went down the rabbit hole, I I assumed as as most normies do, um, and I, I hate to use the word normie because it's because it's it, it, it's it's one of those kind of slightly sort of pejorative terms. I don't want to dismiss people like you know my parents or well actually my parents are quite red pilled <laughs> but i don't want to miss uh, to dismiss all the people who and who haven't yet discovered the truth because i i, I see them as as you know uh, allies in waiting rather than as the enemy um but uh where, where was i that that i used to imagine that okay so maybe maybe one of these conspiracy theories is true but i mean no way they're all going to be true maybe it's the moon landings or maybe it's kennedy and then you start looking at the at the at the the more outlandish stuff, um, say the Beatles, say say Paul, um, or what are the other crazy ones? I, I haven't I haven't looked yet into flat Earth, although I'm sort of sympathetic to. There's the chemtrails, idea. which is semi. Is that a touch more mainstream? Yeah, chem, chem, chemtrails are mainstream now. I mean, you've got you've got footage of. Of you of of UN meetings where where they where they they're perfectly upfront about they, they, they you know they call it weather modification or geoengineering or there's all there's loads right. of evidence Harp. out there that the chemtrails are real it's not that's not that's not a particularly good example I'd say no. I mean, not, not, well Paul McCartney's a clone is out there dinosaurs didn't exist is quite out there yeah it is until you look into until, until you you start looking into it I mean I think. Um, but I'm talking about which ones are perceived as more crazy versus this. Yeah, 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 sure, yeah, one. sure. So what I'm saying is that is that it it it's very easy to knock these things when you haven't looked into them. I, I when when I hear somebody who who understands that that who understands that 9/11 wasn't planned by a man in the ca- in the cave, and when they understand that JFK was not shot by an extraordinarily skilled lone gunman from a, a book depository. Um, when they're saying, "Well, ha ha ha," you think that dinosaurs exist. I don't go. 
um, oh, well, maybe he's caught me out there. I go, well, it just doesn't look to the evidence. You haven't, haven't thought it through. I mean, think about this. Think about this. What is probably the biggest conspiracy theory of our entire Western culture since the, the mid-19th century? What's the, what's the big lie that gets repeated everywhere? Oh, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I thought it was going to be rhetorical. I didn't realize I was going to actually be asked. What's the biggest lie that's been repeated since the 19th century? Yeah. Evolution, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I... This, this again, is a, is a, is a measure of the, the rapidity of my journey. Um, I think that the best journalist of his generation, um, certainly the best journalist I've ever known, was Christopher Booker because he asked the questions that other journalists are afraid to ask. And amazingly, he, he, he flourished in a period where it was still possible to get, get those opinions across in the mainstream press. I, I mean, no way would the Mail publish the kind of pieces that, that it regularly published under Booker's byline on the stupidity of tidal power or, or um, the injustices of the, ca- of the family courts or whatever. I used to chat to, um, and we were, we were obviously we, we worked together on on the, the whole climate the climate wars, but we used to have many private conversations, and he told me uh, towards the towards the end of his life that he had his doubts about evolutionary theory, and I thought bloody hell that's a bit that's a bit wacky uh, he said well yeah yeah he said I, I i i i got flown out to these these high level discussions peter Thiel um flew us out a few of us out we had we had a you know a weekend in a, an agreeable um ranch or whatever in california or something and he mentioned people there I thought, that that's great christopher that is very niche i said, I said really what you, you you don't think evolution is real because like like everyone knows, duh. Like, like everyone knows that that we ha- there was a big bang, and then we then there was a kind of the primordial. We, we've even got phrases for it, haven't we? Everyone knows the sort of primordial swamp, prim- primordial soup, and then we were sort of amoeba and things, and then we sort of became bacteria or or, or bigger things, para paramecians i don't know and then we got bigger and bigger and then yeah and eventually we we you know the ape got bigger and bigger and more sophisticated and it eventually became us and we, you know we everyone knows this it's repeated in pretty much every article about biology ever you know everyone shoehorns in evolution and stuff so here was booker the man i probably most admired the intellect one of the intellects i most admired telling me that he had his doubts about evolutionary theory and to his credit he knew how to operate he didn't say well, James, you've got to realise that it's that it's all it's all complete bollocks. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. He said. He said. Well, he said there are there are, there are one or two problems with it. I said. Well, well, what? He said. Well, um, the the fossil record. The um, have a look at intermediary specimens. I said. What do you mean? Well, well, just just, just you know. Even doubt, you know, uh, and and so he just planted the seeds of doubt, doubt, but didn't push it. And if only we're, we're, the problem we're on when you get down the rabbit hole, you want to go out there and say it's all a lie. Everything's a lie. Everything we've been told is just like you know. Have a look at this. Oh, just jump, blah 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 blah. And, and people just go, he's a madman. He, go away. Leave me alone. I don't want to know. You're crazy. A bit like I, I was with, you know, with, um, when I did that David Aronovich interview, I just, I just, it was just like stuff I didn't, yeah, it's like tr- trying to be in, it was like trying to be sold, uh, um, a, a flat, a holiday share, you know, one of those, um, ho- timeshare, timeshare in Spain, you know, you like, like, no, I don't <laughs> want to be sold a timeshare in Spain. Leave me alone. That, that's how we've been programmed. We've been programmed to think if anyone says anything that, that, that we've been we've been taught to think of as a conspiracy theory, it's like being told sold a timeshare in Spain. Uh, so, so anyway, um, back to to evolutionary theory. I mean, even even ministers in even vicars in the Church of England, probably even the Archbishop of Canterbury, believes in. Well, I'm sure he does. Believes in evolutionary theory. It's it's so accepted that even men of God have now accepted that, like like you. Know, 
um, our understanding of the world has moved on since the Bible. <laughs> like, 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 yeah, right, yeah. Um, and um, you, when you look into it, you, you, you go, what? You mean, even in um, Origin of Species, there's a whole section where Darwin says, look, I mean, I, I, I paraphrase, there is one major flaw in my, in my theory. And then he goes, but yeah, you know, whatever. <laughs> and you think, hang on a second. The, the book where he explains his major theory and he says, yeah, but there's this major, major flaw. It's like gaping. But, but no, don't worry. You know, it, it'll, it'll be solved. We, we can, we can. Um, and you think, hang on a second. So this thing that is taught to us at school and, and, we, and really clever scientists, in fact, all the clever scientists, all the, all the clever biologists, all the, you know, David Attenborough, all the, all the, TV scientists, all the every scientist, no, no, no serious scientist does not believe in evolution. It's just kind of like so, but it's a theory, and that's all it is. And it's a theory with gaping, gaping flaws in it, which have never been successfully explained. Dinosaurs are a, a kind of part of that because you, uh, this takes us into territory like like young Earth theory, and and areas like. It wasn't just Darwin who was pushing a particular line. There were people like in other fields, like like geologists, Charles Lyell, pushed the, pushed the idea about the Earth being a particular age. I mean, I know um, because I've, I've you know I, I used to be good at quizzes. The Earth is four and a half billion years old. You know, so I so I know I know how how old how how far things back back goes. But this is this is the same kind of way of looking at the world that, 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 that embraces evolutionary theory. I'm not, I'm not convinced that the, 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 the world is as old as, as, as um, the, the 19th century scientists have decided it is. And I, th I would suspect that, that somehow dinosaurs are part of that psyop designed to, to create this idea in our heads that there was sort of the eras before us where where these these mysterious creatures that may have been feathered or may not that may have done this may not are kind of just invented by CGI in in studios for Steel, Steven Spielberg movies um, that I do believe that there were things that there were dragons um, that it, it seems obvious to me because because so many cultures dragons are so common to so many cultures. You know the the, the 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 Chinese the 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 Chinese years and stuff. Um, uh, what what year are you? I'm not sure actually. I think I'm a second. snake. I think, um, but there is a dragon, isn't there? And the dra dragons recur in in literature and 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 myth and stuff. I don't think they were just this crazy shit that was just made up because it because they sounded kind of cool. I think I think that there must be. Um, there must be something to it, and, and I suppose you know you you see them in Indonesia today, don't you? The Komodo dragons. You see, a yeah, version. I was going to say it's basically a dinosaur, isn't it? The Komodo dragons, yeah. not far off. Yeah, but so so what I'm saying is, I'm not saying that a certain kind of reptilian didn't stalk the Earth once. That I I just don't believe in brontosauruses and tyrannosaurus and reps and tri tri uh, triceratopses and all the all the other all the other dinosaurs that we're taught to learn and identify when we're when we're you know eleven. I, I just, My problem I just, is they've always changed them, aren't they? The raptors are small, then they're big, and then they've got feathers, and they don't. And I'm like, they obviously don't know exactly. But I said this to Jamie. We we're talking about this with the Reverend Jamie Franklin on on this podcast, and he said, "But where does James? How does James think it was done? Because he." Firstly, I mean, is it was it just is the whole thing? What's the purpose of it? Is it is it just an anti-Christian psyop? Secondly, or is it just a mistake? And secondly, how is it how is that how was it actually done? Was his question? Or how do you think it was done? And I didn't know the answer to that. Oh, I see. Well, you know, I've uh, it, whenever I broach a new subject, I try and get some expert on my podcast to explain um, the background. I mean, I, I think. Somebody called Eric Dubé has has covered this fairly well. Although I wonder whether he's done it quite satisfying enough for me to go, yeah, you're the guy for my podcast. Um, it's it has to do with uh, okay. So when you look at um, one of the ways we can we can ascertain 
conspiracy theories is by looking at looking for tells and when you've been looking at conspiracy theories for a while you 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 realize that that the tells are very similar from conspiracy to conspiracy so for example you will have um in, in almost everyone a a team of self-declared experts which have the knowledge and and we are supposed to take it as read that what they are telling us is is true so the field of paleontology was really invented in two waves in the the 19th century i think the first wave of dinosaur hunters was in the 1840s where these two kind of phineas t barnum type type hucksters uh, set out and, and, and suddenly miraculously started finding all these dinosaur bones, which 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 previous generations. I mean, you, you think about this. You think about you think about the Royal Society founded in 1660. You think about um, the great the great um, uh, gentleman naturalists who went around the world looking for 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 interesting stuff before then the great the great collectors who filled the national gallery with its collections and queue with its collections and so on yeah you know, sir john soane etc etc and you think they didn't know about dinosaurs yet suddenly in the 1840s these two americans suddenly discovered this like this, this all these bones that, that and and the, and you you slotted them together and they made these creatures and i think there was, there was another wave i think in the 1890s and so on. there was a sort of there was dinosaur mania and they started naming these creatures there was a sort of competition to to see who could get the most dinosaur with, with the craziest features oh i'm going to have two rows of spines on the back of this oh i'm going to invent a triceratops and it's got these got these horns in front they just and you you, you look at the early the early dinosaur skeletons that they allegedly found that they're risible they're just there's a complete joke there's a, there's this horn which is obviously a narwhal's there's what i think in a museum in germany germany there's a what what may be an, a narwhal's curly um uh unicorn type horn and then and then there's the you know, bits of mashed together with kind of lamb bones and chicken or or, or whatever um that that when you look at the these these great exhibits in all in all the um, in all the the, the national um, the, the the museums like the Natural History Museum. I mean, every every great city's got a Natural History Museum, and they're one of the. They used to be one of my go to places. You know, I used to always want to go into the into the Blue Whale Hall or the, or the Tyrannosaurus Hall or whatever. And there's a great one in America, in 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 New York, and one in Chicago. Everyone's got them. And why is that? Well, well, okay, I think they're pushing a narrative. But and and why and why are dinosaurs the dominant thing? Again, I, I think they're pushing a narrative. When were these places established? They were they were largely established in about the period where 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 Darwin, Darwinian theory was being pushed, weren't they? Um, and th th have you noticed, for example, how the Natural History Museum in London has recently got a new dinosaur uh, exhibit? And and guess what? It's like you thought you'd seen a dinosaur skeleton before, but wait till you see like, what's he called? Enormosaur or Bigosaur or Gigantosaur. You know, wow! And it took it took the, the world's top paleontologists twenty weeks just to unearth to lift. You know, it took cranes the size of Mount Everest. Oh, all right, I, this is sort of sort of stuff they, they used to sell because it's always got to be bigger, better, faster, more. And you think, well, it's just am I buying into this? This this looks like too good to be true. So, look, come back to me when I found my perfect dinosaur expert. All I will say to you is that most of these these creations you see in the in the the main halls of the Natural History Museum are just that they are creations. That there, there may be two or three real bones and. A gazillion bones which have just been made of plaster casts and they've just they're imaginative they're imaginative reconstructions okay well i sometimes think of myself as a conspiracy moderate maybe you'd call me purple pill but the um the conspiracy moderate take might be maybe dinosaurs are real but there's definitely also an industry that has to keep pumping out new content and new dinosaurs i could see that being a very rational idea i mean obviously that exists. well of course you could they, because you're on the be fence new... <laughs> i'm not on the fence i'm just I, arguing I, I, no, I'm not. I'm not interested. 
I don't, I, I don't care. I just think I just think you're the thing is thing is Nick. It's like this. I, I've. I'm pretty anti-dinosaur, James. I'm just trying to be sort of fair on the podcast, so people don't say he didn't yeah, challenge but, James but, at but all. Yeah, but this is this is something. That, that, this is, I think, one of the one of the the the, the toxic elements in our culture the, the, that we've been trained to think that balance is a good thing, and the, and the, and that we've 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 been taught by the BBC that when you've got somebody representing the left, you have somebody on the right, and they have a discussion, and somewhere in the middle of these points, the truth lies. This is the Hegelian dialectic. It's just, yeah. it's just rubbish. It's part of the psyop. I don't play that game anymore. It's not worth it. It's not interesting. Fair enough. Yeah, it's probably the Toby in my head thinking, oh, you know, yeah, you're right. I mean, you're right. I've, me and Leah are always saying, like, why do we have to have all these lefties on, on GB? And of course, it's because of Ofcom is the, is the literal answer. But yeah, the idea, the dialectic, I sort of, I agree with you. I think there's the truth and that's it, really. So yeah, we don't need to have the person saying, oh, we should have bought babies up to nine months. I'm like, do we have to represent that view? That view has been represented several times on GB News. I'm like, we have to represent the murderers. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of yeah. Well, yeah. I'm very glad you made that point because this, this is where I am now. I believe that our only duty is is to the truth. The, the truth is the only thing that matters. And people say, "Well, what do you mean, your truth or my truth?" No, truth is, is an objective thing. Um, it can be ad- obta- obtained, attained, um, but it requires a process of inquiry. Um, and once you've got close to the truth, you don't really need to waste time entertaining the opinions of people who just haven't looked into it and, or, or are, are prisoners of their own ideology. They're, they're irrelevant. Mm, that's interesting. So that's why you're quite dismissive at times on London Calling because one of my, here's, one of my, here's one take. See what you think of this. Um, if we follow the original red pill metaphor from the Matrix, one thing Neo does is He's red pilled, so he's in the desert of the real, which is kind of where you are now. But he's also for for a laugh, for a bit of fun and stuff, and just I don't know. He goes back and to and to fight the Matrix, I suppose as well. He goes back into the Matrix, shoots a load of cool guns, and flies around. So when I engage with someone like Toby, let's say, even if I radically disagree, I still think it's kind of interesting to talk about what Boris has done or whatever, without thinking it's you know while still being pretty red pilled about it all i can sort of engage whereas your take is more i don't even want to talk about that it's irrelevant but what do you think but in the actual matrix he does engage in a sense with the matrix um i think that there's a danger here um you mentioned boris um i call him johnson now because because i think that that by calling him boris you are you are engaging in the deception, which is that there was this lovable character called Boris. Um, and hilariously, he got to be prime minister somehow. And there's all this amazing sort of Boris creation, the invention of Boris footage all over YouTube, where Boris at that charity rugger match, t- tackling somebody and Boris on the South Bank, throwing a basketball over his head and it going through the hoop. and. Boris, the bumbling character on Have I Got News For You? And it's all part of this elaborate um, theatrical contract um, where we are persuaded that the people who um, who are instrumental in ruining it, our lives at the behest of the people who run the world, that they are, they are on our side, that they're our friends somehow. And so Tobes will get excited about having met, bumped into Boris at, at, at a party and Boris, you know, re- relate, relating the, the banter. And I, yeah, of course, it, it is quite odd and interesting to think that we were friends at university with this chap and, you know, we were all, we were all callow youths or less so in Boris's case, because I think he was already busy inventing himself then and knew exactly who he was and where he was going. But... This same lovable Boris character was the guy who was sent out to um, tell Zelensky, um, you cannot, you know, the, Russians, the Russians want to negotiate a, a peace. They don't want to keep this, this thing going. Boris was, was, uh, Johnson was sent out to Zelensky to, to deliver the message we are we are fighting this thing a that you cannot you, you cannot reach a negotiated 
uh, settlement. You can't reach it. You, you know, there's no room for peace. We want, we want endless war. We want to feed more men into the, the meat grinder. And you think about what it, what it means, what's going on here. So Boris, or Johnson, is part of this ruthless machinery, which is using the Ukraine war partly as a kind of blood sacrifice, a sort of way of, of grinding the young men of a, of a certain... So, so far, thank God, only young Ukrainians and Russians, but soon perhaps our people as well. It's trying to grind them into the dirt in, in, in the same way that, that the, the flower of, 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 of youth were sacrificed in the First World War, you know, like ground into dust and it ended up fertilizer on the Somme, fertilising French wheat, French and Belgian wheat for, for generations after. And Johnson was part of this. Well, you, you can't then start congratulating yourself on what a jolly, jolly chat you had with him after, after a few drinks in a, in, a, in, a, in a club, because these people are, are evil, or they are, part of, they are part of an evil agenda. And it's, I, I can't associate myself with that. I think we've reached the stage in in the affairs of the world where you've got to pick a side are you going to pick good or are you going to pick evil and if you're sitting on the fence well then you may as well let evil win haven't you mm, yeah well i'm not sure if it's the fence necessarily because in my original metaphor i, st I still think there must be a way to engage with the world why not you know being of the world and all that but yeah you, you see it as the, as being on the fence maybe maybe you're right um, well, what what i i mean why what what I, well i sort the, of see it as different level you know you can do gb news for example is gb news perfect no it's regulated by ofcom but i can appear on there and say certain things maybe i can then do lotus eaters and say well let's say weekly skeptic with toby and say some more things maybe lotus eaters i can say some more on my own podcast i can say more maybe maybe there are different levels and different layers where, where one can engage Without always, you know, without it being... But you're sort of more all or nothing, obviously. That's your approach. Well, look, I mean, I think that there are things that one can say about LGBTQ+, plus or about the culture wars issues. Um, but I think that the culture wars are a way that people can, in the nicest possible way... People can pretend to be a bit edgy and contrarian and like fighting for freedom without actually fighting for freedom. That, that yeah, these, these are distracting issues. They're not the real thing. Because a, a counter to that might be that, you know, let's say someone like Andrew Doyle does great work on a number of culture war issues. And then, you know, you're doing your thing and maybe they can all exist. They're all sort of broadly... They're broadly anti this, you know, obviously you go a lot further and Andrew is very strange. He sort of didn't see through the COVID narrative at all, it seems. Well, I, 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 that's not quite the case. Actually, to be fair, that's misrepresenting. I brought him on my podcast. He said, actually, he was criticizing things like COVID passports from the start and all this. He just didn't understand the what he saw as the sort of epidemiological part of it. Well, and has he come out since against the vaccines? Yeah, I think he's, I think he, I, I don't want to misrepresent his position, but the point is, there are people that fight certain things and then there are others others for other things and we can all sort of one thing that's bothered me see what you think to this is there's been this kind of purity police i call them that's emerged whereby we if we don't do everything perfectly according to them i'll, I'll give you one example i get a lot which is that i was supposed to quit gb news when mark stein quit so I'm, no problem with mark stein would be interesting to chat to him never met him I believe I was probably earlier on to the COVID stuff than him. I believe my vaccination status is more pure than his. I don't, can't say for sure because I don't know it, but I, I believe that. You didn't know Mark Steins. He, he had the jab. That's why he's right. Got I didn't cancer. want to say if it wasn't definitely true. I thought he did. Okay, it wasn't one hundred percent. So there you go. So I so I'm a pure blood. So but then suddenly, and I've been against it from an earlier point than than Stein, and yet yeah. I get all these people tweeting me telling me I have to quit my job, and they know nothing about my background or his background. Maybe his life's much easier than mine. Maybe it's taken me years and years to even begin to have any money at all. But I'm supposed to quit. But I will quit, James, on my own principles, but not on yeah. someone else's that are made up that I'm well, being told on Twitter. But isn't there a danger of this side? Uh, you know, we get... Well, what do you think? 
Well, luckily, luckily you've, you've made it easy for me by giving, giving a really extreme example. Of, of, of course you shouldn't um, quit your job at GB News, uh, except on your, totally on your own terms. I mean, you're, you're, you're a young man. You, you, you need a career. You need money. You've got, you, you know, you've got talents which are suited, suited to the job. Why should you throw yourself on the altar of, of principles so high that almost nobody could could live up to them? I, I wouldn't expect... Of course you're going to get people on, people who are sort of uber, uber zealots. I, I, I agree with you. Look, there are people who purity spiral me. I mean, there are people who... That, that, <laughs> who are those uh, people? Like, like James yeah. isn't pure enough. I mean, that's, that's, to me, that's Yeah, incredible. there are people who think I'm a... I mean, I, I, I get all sorts. There was, there's, there's a website which specializes in um, looking at your... Um, do you know about elite gender inversion? Um, EGI. I don't think so. Not no. Well, this is this is this is one of the more. Unless you niche. mean like having trans kids, Hollywood people having trans kids and stuff. You don't mean that. That well, I, I think part of it is is this is again one of the one of the more um, outre rabbit holes. Um, that that. Uh, a lot of a lot of the the actors that you think are men are women, and and the actresses you think are women are, are, are men, and and stuff like that. And maybe it's been like this way for a long time. And people have looked at so so so, so they, they 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 take people in in the public eye. Not that I really am, but but um, and they examine their skeletal structure, and they decide whether or not you're a man or a woman. I think I think they decided that I was I was a woman. Uh, and other people say so uh, i i tried to get uh, do a podcast with somebody in new zealand and i was very firmly rebuffed that i was clearly you know with my background clearly uh, part of the in, the intelligence psyop and and stuff so so yeah i, I i've got some sympathy for, with your position i mean that's fine uh, against that I would say that there are there are people um, on us purportedly on on the side of the awake, for want of a better word, um, who are not, who are definitely um, infiltrators, gatekeepers, controlled opposition. There are different there are different levels of of um, insidiousness and 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 untrustworthiness and and betrayal um but but for example i i read i i read a substack essay de detailing this it was called put not your trust in jordan peterson so it's it's not that i'm saying that everyone everyone except me is controlled opposition or or a gatekeeper or whatever what i am saying is that it is part of the enemy's MO that they will subvert the resistance by planting among their number seemingly seemingly friendly figures who, who say the sort of things they want to hear but who are actually traitors or, or Judas goats or they're, they're, they're a distraction they're not really serving our interests Interesting, what was your take on Peterson then because my thing is, I think he's very strong on, on a lot of things. On politics, not so much. He used to work he worked for the UN. For some reason, he was said Kavanaugh should stand down. He thought Mike Pence is the future the, a few weeks ago. So on politics, he has these bad takes. But on other things, and he's, he's a psychiatrist. So, right. you, which is which is a junk science. The, 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 I mean, the, uh, many so many of our current ills can be traced back to to Freud, who. I mean, it's nominative determinism, or there's a clue in the name. Freud was a fraud, uh, and and you think about who the 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 Freud dynasty since that you know like Matthew Freud, PR, it's, it's a relationship with the son and 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 Lucian Lucian fraud. I mean, I I I like his paintings, but they're a bit. There's a, there's a sort of pervy there's a pervy element in there isn't there and and his his uh there's something creepy creepy about about him um that that um sorry what did i why was i mentioning freud 
you were saying uh, that he's a fraud and that you've got to watch out for these controlled opposition mm. people and uh, oh, and yeah. oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. But John Peterson, a, a shrink. But that, that, that isn't, my case doesn't depend on that. I think, short version, I think the function of Peterson is to say the kind of, the kind of um, tough, tidy your room, sit up straight, do this, do that stuff that, that, um, that, that confuse young men might benefit from and everyone goes yes exactly they should tidy their rooms and sit up straight and 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 you know these young men will often say yeah jordan peter's 12 rules for life it helped me to put my life together yeah but what it also did is channel your rage into the sort of self-obsession when perhaps you should be thinking about the bigger picture about what's happening in the world so he he sort of corrals potential opposition into pens and sort of defangs them you know Mm, interesting well that leads to i mean that leads to an obvious question as well what do you think about andrew tate he's another figure who i know he's been on your podcast and he follows me on twitter we've had some dms full disclosure i have met him but he was on your podcast just before he sort of blew up massively and lo- loads of it, loads of us were following him for years and he was just he didn't have that many views he was, just, he was quite interesting but suddenly he went massive but you had him on your show so because he's another figure who very divisive on the conservative side some many people tell me i shouldn't back him other people are, do back him because he's on our side broadly in the culture. Yeah, world. Uh, isn't that funny? Why should people care? This is the thing. Why should people become so invested in these personalities that it matters whether or not you have your allegiance to them or not? It's like, like having a football team. Yeah. Do you support Man U? No, I hate Man U. Fuckers. No, I support <laughs> Man City or Arsenal. It's, it's like this. It's just divisive, isn't it? What does it matter what you think about? It means nothing. He's just a name. I mean... For my for myself, I found him one of the most fluent, engaging, interesting, intelligent guests I've ever had on my podcast. You know, you can talk to him for hours. I mean, there was that podcast recently where somebody interviewed him for, for five hours, and he yeah. he just Patrick Bet David. It was it was he was never boring, and he says a lot of stuff that makes a lot of sense, a lot of intellectual sense, a lot of emotional sense. You think, great, Andrew. Uh, I still think he's controlled opposition. I mean, because there's, 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 you know, his father was was CIA. Um, I, I think his brothers kind of spilled the beans. But um, look, I think it's possible to really, really like somebody and like so much of what they say while recognizing that they are ser- they are serving some ulterior purpose, which one doesn't quite understand. I don't know what. I don't know. Yeah. You know, the, it's something to do with his conversion to Islam, it's something to do with his position on women. Maybe he's just there to be divisive. I know he's got a function, but it doesn't mean I don't think he's great. Hmm, interesting. Well, I, I, I disagree with these controlled opposition. I know his dad was, yeah, briefly in the CIA, but mainly was a chess master who had no money. And that seems to me not particularly a relevant fact, in my opinion. But it's interesting you say that. I've been criticised constantly. Oh, yeah, you're not allowed to like Andrew Tate. It's a good point. Like, why, why do we have to take some stance on him? I've had so many people message me on my side of things like, oh, what, you say you're conservative and then you don't like Tate. I'm like, Are you, and then you like Tate. I'm like, whatever. And yeah. um, just annoying that they try and tell me what to think, if nothing else. But then aren't you saying my point earlier about engaging in the matrix just for sort of out of interest? You, aren't you saying, oh, I'm, I don't t- trust Tate, but he's still enjoyable. So you're sort of saying you can engage on some level, even while... No, I, 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 I don't make rules like that. I, 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 I like to engage on a case-by-case basis. So, for example, if Tobes were to find me a story from Normie World that I found interesting, like, I don't know, something to do with a movie we'd seen, um, or then, then I, I might run with it. I wouldn't automatically go, this story belongs in Normie World... Uh, or this is a culture wars, and I and I am now so grand that I don't do culture wars anymore. I do just I'm just a bit sceptical about it all. Okay, fair enough. Because <clears throat> yeah, sometimes I, that's interesting. Sometimes I might think you just have this overarching take, but it's just a case by case thing. Are you sort of ha- happier with it now, James? Because some people some people say like, oh, I worry about James, or they say James has gone mad and stuff. But I sometimes have worried about you, not in a patronizing way like that, like a, oh. a, a, a concern trolling way. I've worried about you slightly in the way that becoming, taking an overdose of red pills, let's say, or, and becoming black pill, that you, just, you become very nihilistic. I see myself more as like, I've followed this stuff for years. I'm probably permanently semi-black pill and just sort of live like that. 
but and probably everyone should worry about me as well but but with you I thought oh you've gone so far into it and you seem to then get very nihilistic and now you seem a bit better again I don't know am I right have you gone on a sort of journey no I mean I know, I, know, I mean I think I've been pretty good for some time I'm I'm white pilled don't forget I'm not not you know, you're white pilled because you've then gone you've discovered Christianity and you yeah. you sort of yeah. yeah so that's sort of and you can't be you, you you can't be unhappy when you've got Jesus I mean you can't be because you understand that that all this is meant to be and that God has got your back and, and that this is all, all written that, um, and it gives you, it gives you strength and, and joy because you know, you know that, that whatever happens in this world is not the end. And, um, yeah, it changes your, your understanding of the world. But I, I'm, I mean, to answer your question, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't think I've ever been, happier in my skin i've discovered what i enjoy doing i've got this job if you could even call it a job where i i not only enjoy doing it and i can earn a you know just about a, a, a living from it um and uh, i feel like i'm doing something really useful and important in the world and you know i i, I sort of partly i think i'm there to reassure my constituency that they're not alone and that they're not going mad and partly I'm there to evangelize both for to help people understand the world better but also understand the the, the spiritual world better to, the, the, to to bring them over to to Christ because that is where happiness and salvation lie and it, I, I, I I used to sort of I think Culturally, we've we've been we've been encouraged to think of Christianity as a sort of cringe thing, and, and uh, you know, when, whenever God bother us come along, that um, oh, right, run away, run away. Um, now you ask yourself why that is. What, what, why why would that be? Why why would the, the 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 thing that you're encouraged to be be embarrassed about be Christianity and Christians? Well, I would argue that this is a sign that that the forces of darkness have been in operation in our world and well have been since since time immemorial but but are, but are probably getting more and more and more advanced in their um their diabolical plan um but at the same time i'm careful not to, i don't i don't like frightening the horses you know I, I like horses and i don't want to frighten them and i i don't want to sort of um I don't want to put off would-be converts by by seem, seeming too too upfront. I just want to kind of but that is definitely part of my mission, though, because hmm. it's made me you... very happy. Oh, good. Well, I'm, I'm glad. I mean, yeah, Alistair Williams had a very similar thing as well. He 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 had discovered Christianity and was much happier, of course. One review criticised me for saying he's saying, "Oh, it's just become evangelising on your podcast now, Nick. It started well and all this." This is endless criticism. We, we mainly have great reviews, by the way, but this, the bad ones stay with me. But, but on that question, when did you? You said it was the twenty sixteen election that made you sort of red pill. When did you sort of go back to Christianity? Then, or was there a moment again, or was it gradual? Oh well, um, it, it's like the um, that question about you know um, how did you go bankrupt um, very slowly and then all at once. Um, I, I I had a sort of I'm writing a book about this at the moment, and and uh, you what you realise is that when you look back, there are these staging posts on your journey to like there was. So when I was at Oxford, I had this friend called Wilton and Wilton, Wilton Barnhart. He's a, he's a successful American novelist and he's a literary professor in North Carolina. And Wilton and I used to go on these spectacular road trips. Uh, um, so I said, "Well, spectacular! They're bloody exhausting. A lot, a lot of a lot of culture crammed into a short space." And one year, he said, you know, "Do you want to come with me to Mount Athos?" And um, I was, um, well, "Where?" He said, "Well, it's a it's a peninsula, and and and, and since since the era of Emperor Constant, Constantine, no no female has been allowed there. You're not even allowed female." livestock and uh it's 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 a, a sort of colony of it's a, it's a peninsula with all these monasteries on them some, some of them dating back to the 13th century and 
I, I, I've applied for a special pass for us to go there. Do you want... I thought, well, monasteries? Uh, yeah, I guess. So I go on this trip. And, you know, like, I'm, I'm 19, 20. And all I'm really thinking about is I want to be... If I'm going to Greece, I want to party and, and take... Well, I don't know to take drugs. It's quite, it was quite hard to get drugs in Greece in those days. But certainly drink lots of beer and, and, and try and pick up birds and shag them, you know, like that. And so here we are. Here I am going with a with a with a, an older, um, you know, an Oxford postgrad, and we're going to this this peninsula in the blazing heat where you can't wear short sleeve shirts because the monks find it. You you can't get. You're not allowed to go swimming, and and the the, the highlight of your day is is, is e- eating monastic food in monasteries after a long trek on these. The, but I remember one, once that there was an experience. A sort of um, we got to this one monastery in 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 these in these woods, and they're they're, they're very medieval. That there were these huge wooden doors, and with with a little grill, and, and and you knock on the door, and is anyone home? And then this face appears at the grill, and and then a novice monk might come in, and and he'll give you this well water with with a, a bit of sherbet in the bottom. It's very, very medieval. And you drink this cooling draft of cooling water, wondering what's at the bottom of the well and whether it's clean or not. And then the, the abbot, abbot appears, and the abbot is, he's got incredible, piercing, pale, but very piercing, intense blue eyes and, and you know, the beard and stuff. And, he's, uh, and, and it's like he can see through you and, and, and you're, you find yourself in the presence of extraordinary holiness and you think that this is a man of God and, and it, 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 it plants the seeds. So you, you then, moments like this, and then you fast forward and then, as you say, you, you, once you get, you've taken too many red pills, inevitably you get the black pill. You realise the world is so messed up and there is so much evil in the world. That's 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 the thing. You see so much evil. What can we do in the face of this? There is no hope. There are no white hats. Not even not even President Trump is a good guy because he pushed the vaccines. You know why? Why was that? You know what? He he's not one of us. He's not really. He just poses. He's, he's a disruptor. Maybe he, he you know says some good stuff we like, like Jordan Peterson does, and like you know Andrew Tate. But he's not not really. He's just, he's he's part of the soil. Um. And you think, well, what hope is there? And you then you then start thinking, well, hang on a second. If there is this so much evil abroad, and who is the author of this evil? It's got to be. That it can only be the devil. The the, the devil is real. The, 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 there's no other explanation for this kind of the depth of depravity in the world. And you think, well, if, if there's a devil. That must mean that stuff I read in the Bible about Jesus and about God. There must be a counter because this is a world of dualities, isn't it? That everything has its opposite. Every concept, good and evil, hot and cold, um, night and day. It's how, it's how the world seems to be arranged. So, you know, we've got a sort of observational um, check, if you like, to sort of compare with, with our sort of growing religious understanding. Um, and... Um, I sort of went from there, really, and it, and it, and there's a feeling that grows, and you get these moments of um, just moments where you experience it. Uh, I, I mean, I I didn't see angels or whatever, but I just felt this sense that that God is with us. You know, if only if only we ask Him for help, if only we, um, and this has grown since I've you know. Then you start reading the Bible. And your faith grows, and you get sort of shaky moments. You, it, 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 it's, it's very fun at the start because you get all these weird experiences, like you know when you do sort of, you open the Bible at random page, and and lo, you can, you, you find that the text you read is extraordinarily relevant to your experiences. It, it gives you, it, it's like it's like magic, but you, it's not called magic. It's it. This is this is holiness. This is this is. Um, how it works. This is this is the the real the real magic. This is this is Christian Christian magic. Um, and, and by the way, the, 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 there there are some there are some sort of holier than thou Christians who say that you shouldn't play these games. You know, you shouldn't. It's like a form of divination doing this in the Bible. But 
I'd refer them to St. Augustine. This is how Augustine finally, finally converted to Christianity. He'd held off for a long time, you know, the, the, the famous phrase, a Lord make me chaste, but not yet, because he was quite a, quite a shagger. And uh, one day he had this sort of feeling that, that, you know, things were really amiss and he needed to do something. So he opened his Bible randomly and the passage basically said, you know, stop whoring and drinking and, and, and throw off all your kind of worldly. And he realized that this was a sign because it, 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 this stuff is there if you look for it. It's not, it's not, it's not made up, made up stuff that it's not as atheists tell you, um, stuff that our ancestors made up to cope with the fact that they didn't want to die and also to create a religion to bind people. It's, it, there's more to it than that. Wow. Well, yeah. Well, I talked about my experience of a dream where I saw Jesus and God in the episode with Reverend Jamie Franklin, if anyone wants to listen to that. So I certainly have had those moments. And, but what, what were these shaky moments? Because you, you said it's fun at first. So that's why I'm re- referencing that. But then you said, but there's also shaky moments. You mean where you, you doubt things and stuff? Oh, 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 well, I suppose that the, the, the downside, um, well, there is a downside because I don't care, um, is that you become a target for the forces of darkness. Um, the, the, the demonic forces will try and rattle your cage. They'll, they'll, you, you definitely, um, they try and, they're like, thing is they haven't really got, got power over you because once you've once you've accepted jesus into your life he protects you from from that that because don't forget these things right these creatures are only doing it by god's permission and they're and they're going to lose but definitely you do become a target for the forces of darkness but i'm but i meant also on a more trivial level that you Ideally, what you'd want is signs all the time showing you that, you know, amazingly cool stuff. You know, you, you, you want to go for a walk and see an angel and you'd want a miracle to happen with this and that. And it's and it's 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 um, it's more subtle than that. It becomes it becomes more subtle. Um, but I have noticed I, I, I was doing a, a podcast with Brian Gerrish um, and I, I quoted this psalm. And it, I might as well mention it again. Um, there's a psalm, psalm number one, because it's it's like the well the psalm that sort of explains everything and launches everything, and it, and and it, you may remember it from school. It's um, uh, uh, blessed is the man that hath not walked in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stood in the way of sinners, and hath not sat in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and will, in his law will he exercise himself day and night. Uh, and he shall be like a, a tree planted by the waterside that will bring forth his, his fruit in, in due season. His leaf also shall not wither. And look, whatsoever he doeth, it shall prosper. And that, I mean, some people base their whole lives on, on maybe one or two lines from the Psalms. But if you made that, if you make that your watchword, it's really not bad. I mean, you know, I'm not. I'm not perfect. I'm not. Yeah, I mean, um, I still like the old smoke and stuff, and I still swear and 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 and. But I think that if you have at the back of your mind to try and live according to the precepts of the Bible of of Christ, you know, you're never gonna you're never gonna live up to Christ. Um, not only will you live a better life and a more fulfilled life but also god will have your back that that he does sort things out which is interesting so mm. are you are you uh, are you actually a christian or, or not yeah i'm a christian but um you know i have these things where people attack me because i don't go to church enough or something no, no. like that but, well, yeah, th- but th- I, I don't oh yeah because because of the church england is a nightmare and all that yeah, uh, it, it's not that I've, uh, you know, I haven't got a, a committed position where I'm saying, yeah, we shouldn't go to church. Church is crap. <laughs> you know, I'll go, I'll go if there's a nice service on or, you know, whatever. But, but it's not, I don't think it's as essential as, as some Christians would tell you. It's just my, it's just my view. We're all yeah. imperfect, aren't we? 
Yeah, well, I, I think the key part is belief in God, belief in Jesus, belief in the resurrection, but more so than the going to church. But I, but I do I do need to do that as well, I think. But, you know, yeah, some people say it's very crucial. Some people less so. Obviously, people like, we've had Calvin Robinson on and Jamie Franklin. Obviously, they think it's crucial. Yes, and so does my friend Gavin Ashenden. Gavin, Gavin Ashenden says that it's really, you know, he, he really worries about my soul because, or, or, or no, not my soul, but he worries about, I need to take communion more. Um, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. I came about back to it first from sort of consciously. I thought that Peterson, his genius was that he'd reintroduced a Christian ethics to, the, to, to a large number of people who would have rejected Christianity. But I also thought the flaw in it was that he's, he's ambiguous about the belief part. And I thought, well, look, it's great everything he's saying, but it would be great to have the actual belief part. And then I realized, well, why can't I just consciously have the belief part? That's how it started for me. And then later other things, more miraculous type things happened or, you know, but but that was a it was a conscious decision and um, some people have said to me you can't really do that or that they can't do that but i don't see what's wrong with that rationally it's always a, a, a faith, that's what faith is ultimately isn't it it's always a choice right so i saw nothing wrong with that and some christians have told me i'm actually on the right lines with that so that was it's interesting that just just to um sidetrack you a moment you 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 kind of inadvertently put your finger on 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 the problem with jordan peterson that his agenda ultimately is luciferian um rather than christian because have you read c.s lewis's that hideous strength uh no i haven't read that one actually or you're familiar with the story about the tower of babel yeah it's essentially the the the, the luciferian agenda has always been to supplant god by replacing him on earth um and it's so what Jordan Peterson is is trying to do or affecting to do is to create an ethical system where, where which is like Christianity but is not Christianity where where God and Jesus have been removed, and you look at how the how the pharmaceutical industry works. The, what's the model? It's about creating these synthetic products which mimic things which are already available in our God-given nature, but it's much hard to get patents on, on nature, but they can patent these synthetic drugs. Um, it's, I mean, we, we, we could do several podcasts on this, that, that, they're, that they're, trying to, they're trying to replace, trying to kill God and and recreate their sort of create their own sort of warped heaven on earth and it's mm. it's 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 devoid of devoid of, of 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 the spirit it's devoid of of anything meaningful it's sterile it's 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 uh which i've got which is why i i i kind of feel sorry for them i kind of feel sorry for these these losers they've got all the money and the power but ultimately they're like Dr. Faustus at the end of at the end of Dr. Faustus. They're being dragged off to hell. And, and was it worth it? Was it really worth seeing meeting Helen of Troy? Was it worth going? Was it worth you know all the things that he got in his brief life? Yeah, it's interesting. You, you mentioned how Christianity has been made to seem cringe. And there's also have you noticed this? Because just as we record this, the BBC scandal has been breaking, and and there's this strange take from the Alistair Campbells of the world saying that. Oh, this guy, this BBC presenter, Hugh Edwards, you know, he's got mental health problems, so we should let him off. Or the Sun newspaper have been disgusting. And there's an, a desperate attempt to not look at all at the morality of his actions. He's married, yet he's been paying for pictures, allegedly, from when I get sued, but allegedly from, uh, from you know, a young boy or a teenager. And it, much, it reminded me of the Matt Hancock thing as well. It was like, People were desperate to say in the mainstream media, oh, I've got no problem with what he does in his private life, but he broke the lockdown rules. You, it was almost like a desperation to say, we don't care about marriage. We don't care about any conventional morality. We want to be, almost signal that we hate that, but then we care about some other thing like the Sun newspaper or the lockdown rules. There's a sort of, amongst the new elite, if you want to call them that, there's this, whatever they are, this media elite, whoever, the Alastair Campbell types, the people that Matt Goodwin cites, there's a desperation to seem as immoral as possible almost as a bad badge of honor do you, do you see what i mean yeah yeah well all these um every story in the media has its um ostensible purpose and then there is the, the then there is the real agenda underneath it's always it's always like that so 
I mean, the the the, the recent non-story involving um, the news presenter, who nobody cares about really, is to well, it, it probably serves a number of purposes. I mean, on the surface, it's about ooh, here's a bit of tittle tattle about a celebrity, but underneath it. It promotes a number, number of other agendas. For example, the idea that, yes, as you suggest, uh, a married man, a married, much older man, that when he allegedly pays 35 grand to a crackhead rent boy <laughs> um, and, and the story gets reported in the media um, that somehow this, this guy is the victim. <laughs> I mean... Uh, and at the same time, it promotes the idea that, yeah, it's a bit dodgy, but he did nothing illegal. So it, so it sort of reinforces in the public imagination that, 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 OK, so it's not right exactly, but it's not as bad as, as, as they, they, they feared it might be when they first read the story. Uh, it, it gradually contributes to the, to the moral degradation of society. Uh, it distracts from the much more serious sexual problem, sexual crimes committed by by the, the establishment, um, by the entertainment industry. I mean, you think, we're, we're talking terrible, terrible, terrible things that happen, you know, m mostly involving underage children. And the, the entertainment industry, the music industry, uh, the establishment is rife with this. And yet here we are, where, where, where it is being suggested to us that the worst sex crimes out there being committed by celebrities are legal you know exchange of money uh for naughty photographs with a kind of 17 year old well it's it, it's it trivializes the real problems of the world and distracts people yeah 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 i agree um all right well that was a really great section on christianity um because we've done quite a long time James. don't, don't want to keep you forever but i do want to ask just a couple more little things i always ask you may have answered them already in various ways but i like to ask people whether the country, Britain or England, if you prefer, is is finished. What do you think? What do you think about that? Yeah, it's finished. Yeah, <laughs> that was a quick one. I mean, yeah, I mean, I wrote an article on my Substack saying England is lost forever. So I do kind of feel like that. Why? Because of what mass immigration? Because of everything? Everything. Yeah, fair enough. But but by design, the, we're 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 watching the controlled demolition of 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 the West of Western civilization for what it's worth. And this has been planned by a satanic, um, the people who've always run the world. Um, the, you know, these are the, the people in charge now are the descendants of the ancient, ancient bloodlines. Their loyalties are to, to Satan. And of course, Satan wants us all to have a jolly miserable time and to, to, to destroy God's creation. So go figure. All right, no offence sitting on that one. Um, this one is almost answered perhaps by that one, but I always like to ask if we can win. You, you might not like the frame of the question, but I sometimes ask, can we win the culture war? Perhaps it's a spiritual war. Is there any way of winning this on this earth then, James? What do you think? Well, we do win. We will win. But I suspect that probably at this stage we're going to need, and we're going to get, divine intervention. Um, I mean, you know your Bible. You, the, there are loads of instances where the children of Israel are really up against. It. I mean, you think about the forces that uh, that are arrayed against them. That the, there's Babylon, there's Egypt, there's the Assyrians, the whoever. Well, there's the the the, the hosts of Midian, the Canaanites. They're, I mean, they're surrounded by enemies who want to kill them, and they're often grossly outnumbered, and there are occasions where God just, uh, well, yeah, God just sends sends a, hand, a handful of them forth, and they they beat the enemy. I think that I think that's how it is. I, I I mean, look, it's possible that thanks to the work that you and I do and others, that will awaken awaken enough people in in time. But people are waking up. I mean, although people are waking up, they're still doing it quite slowly, in my view. Yeah. Certainly, the COVID era has accelerated it, but but yeah, maybe not enough. There's still an awful lot of normies out there. Yeah, yeah. 
Fair enough, but it wasn't quite as negative as I thought. I mean, you know, you, you, like, like you say, you're white pulled now, and it's uh, it was fairly fairly optimistic. Not so much on the Britain front. Oh, I think I, 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 I look, look, I, I'm, I hope that one of the, one of the reasons that people enjoy the stuff I do is that although I talk about some dark things, there's always a sense of joy or at least humor or, um, yeah, I think optimism is built into, into it because how could it not be if you're a Christian? Um, and it's not kind of unfounded optimism either. It's 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 certainty, you know. I, I mean, th- the story ends well for those of us who who um, who are not the ungodly. <laughs> Less so. Yeah, not for, yeah. That's, that's a good point. Um, As for the ungodly, it is not so with them, for they are like the chaff, which mm. the wind scattereth away from the face of the earth. <laughs> yeah. I'm impressed as well that you've memorized all these things and, and the whole psalm. It's it's good. I need to. Memorize well, it's what monks more. used to have to do back in the day. Right. They had to right. they had to learn the entire psalter. So I'm just a beginner. I'm right. a novice. That's I want awesome. to be an abbot one day. Yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe you'll get there um, with my beard in my in my monastery in Mount Athos. Yeah, where only men are allowed. Like sort of like. Well, actually, no, you know what I'd really like. <laughs> I'd like a parsonage in the country with a string of hunters in my stables. I can see it, James. You, you seem quite close. You've got the horses. You're into the hunting. Well, I haven't, but I haven't got them. But I, but I, but I, yeah. Right. You're horse adjacent. I'm horse adjacent, yeah. <laughs> Harlings are good. Harlings are my friend. Yeah. And why do you think you're doing so well? You've got, you sold out like 900 seats. Your podcast is very popular. Do you think it's just that you're just telling the truth as it is? Well, I've got, I, I, I'm quite a niche podcaster, but I've got a very loyal audience um, who I, when I'm not burning them, which I do, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite strict. I'm like my, my, I had this brilliant, I had this brilliant tutor when I was at, at university um, who I credit with forming my mind. I mean, his politics are completely different from mine, but the point is his politics never entered into our tutorials, you know, our discussion of literature. It was never tainted by the crap that taints most English literature courses. Um, I, and I love him and I always respect him. Um, and I'll be eternally grateful for what he's called Peter Conrad. He's, he's a genius. Um, but if you went into his tutorials and you said something clever, he, you know, he'd, he'd deign to acknowledge that maybe you'd made a, a, an almost acceptable point. But if you said something stupid, you just like, he let you know. And I'm afraid that's rather how I, <laughs> I treat people in my in my chat channels and stuff. You know, I, I don't take any prisoners. I burn them, uh, which is bad because I, I I suppose I should be sucking up to my supporters, but I can't do it. It's a, it's not really on brand. You know, I no. I love my supporters and I'm grateful to their support. But if they're gonna t- if they're gonna say stupid shit to me, then th- then they can fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's how your tutor used to put it as well. Um, all right, but you're smashing. It. I mean, and so people obviously should go to the Delling Pod if they don't already which they probably do if they listen to this or a lot of them and obviously and your twitter seems to have been hacked so they can't really go they there can't the get can't find me on twitter at the moment they can find me on 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 substack and on locals and subscribe star and patreon and those they can buy me coffee but yeah i'm i'm at, at most of the usual outlets um I, I do print essays as well occasionally um and my live events are really good if when i can get around to organizing them i've got one coming up on the 28th of this month, July, in Dorset, um, which is on, um, what's it called? Eventbrite? Okay. Eventbrite, yeah. Um, so you, you can find it there, Delling Pod Live or something, with, with Clive DeCarl. And that, okay. that'll be good. I mean, it, it, it'll be good because there's only 300 seats. For, so the smaller events, you get more of a chance to kind of, you know, they're more intimate. The bigger mm-hmm. ones, I mean, I, I want to say hello to everyone, but you can't really if it's 900 people. Okay. Awesome. Are you, have you got another London one coming up? I've got some bigger ones. Co- I'm trying to avoid London just because people will say, "Why are you doing it in London? Why can't you do it near me?" I've yeah. got one possibly coming up in in um, uh, the Middle England, um, one in the North, and one in Wales. Sort of coming up in the next three or four months, but I haven't finalised them yet. Okay. With some big names. And I'm, I've missed your substack. Just quickly, what is your substack name? Just James Dellingpole. James Dellingpole, I think. 
Okay, for some reason I haven't checked it out. All yeah, right. my sub stacks are really good. I mean, some people some people think I'm a better writer than I am a podcaster. I mean, I think my podcasts are all right, but I but I mean, I've been writing a long time, and I do I do do a good good essay. Yeah, I think I am kind of the uh, the Carlisle de nos jours. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, yeah, I'm sure you're. I mean, you've been doing it for years. I, I actually think I'm a better writer than podcaster, but never do it. It's hard to find time for all these different things. There's so yeah. many mediums, and you podcasts you've got to keep churning them out. But thanks so much for doing it, James. I thought it was very interesting and lots of surprising, Pleasure. interesting things. And um, yeah, and good luck with everything you're doing. And yeah, thanks for doing the show. I'll see you. No, I'm sorry for for making it so hard. You 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 were asking, you know, you were saying how nice it was doing the podcast. I, I mean, I've I've always been eager to do your podcast, really eager. And the fact that I've, it's taken me about three months to do it is is just a function of my flakiness and my you know <laughs> I don't, I don't like planning things in advance. Right, I know it's I know, but it's sort of necessary, isn't it, with podcasts? Because you've got to, if you miss a week, it's all over. So you have to sort of bank them all. You, you still, this, despite your alleged fakeness, you still get some amazing guests. I don't know how you're doing it. Well, I've got I've got a, I've got a very talented team who, who right. are not as flaky as I am. That's why. I mean, they, I, otherwise, it would be hopeless. <laughs> okay, this is what I need the team. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing it all myself. Really. Well, no, shout out to Jason's producing it and, and other people. We've got I've had various people help me. So yeah. So all right, thanks, James. Thanks, Nick.